It is good to be with you to study together again tonight. I hope you're all doing well, and I hope to see you this coming Sunday at either 9 o'clock or 11, and I hope all of us can be together for class at 10. I've enjoyed getting back into the book of Hebrews. And for our members, please remember to continue to use the Sign Up Genius account to sign up for one of the two worship services. It's based on your email address that's in the church directory. Those addresses were pre-approved, but uh, guests are always welcome. We just hope to see you this coming Sunday at 9, 10, and 11. Um, and we're looking forward to that. In terms of good news this week, I haven't shared anything for a little while, anything personal like that, but uh, Sunday after worship, uh, went, got some lunch, went home, packed up, and rode my bike uh, 23 point something miles down to Blue Mountain State Park and had a great experience over there hammock camping for the very first time and uh, just had a good night, slept really well. Uh, was not harassed by raccoons at all overnight, unlike the last time I went uh, camping over at Blue Mountain on my bike a number of years back. This was a lot better, actually very comfortable in the hammock, and again, first time for that, and I learned a lot of what to do and not to do next time. And I uh, turned around early on Monday morning and came back home. Total of, I think, 47 point something miles uh, round trip. And that included a little bit of a detour over in Mount Horeb to try to find some breakfast. Uh, the breakfast place I was planning on uh, closed at the last minute on Monday. There was kind of a handwritten scribbled note on the door saying, closed, uh, come back some other time. But anyway, ended up finding a good breakfast in Mount Horeb. And I just wanted to share that I had a good trip this week and that went really well. Uh, tonight we are continuing with our study of the book of Acts, and Acts, of course, if you have not been with us over the past several weeks, it was a book written by Luke, who was a medical doctor. It explains the growth of the early church. Uh, we would consider the book of Luke, volume one, the life of Christ, covering the 30 years of the Lord's life on this earth, give or take. And then the book of Acts covers the growth of the early church, and so it would be considered volume two, so from roughly 30 to around 60 AD. Uh, up to this point in the book, we have looked at the first 10 chapters. We are now partway through chapter 11. And we've been using the ABCs of Acts as something of a memory tool. It has helped me through the years. My dad taught these to the middle and high school class down in Crystal Lake, Illinois, when I was growing up there in the mid-80s. I know we went through this a time or two there. But in the ABCs of Acts, we have the Ascension in chapter 1. We have the beginning of the church in chapter 2. We have the man who couldn't walk, who was carried and cured in chapter 3. We had the determined disciples who wouldn't stop preaching even though they were threatened in chapter 4. In Acts 5, we had the empty jail as uh, Peter and the other apostles are arrested and then they're let out of jail by the angel. We had the first deacons, but always with a question mark in Acts chapter 6, since they are not officially given that title, but they do seem to do the work that deacons would do. In chapter 7, we had Stephen, the great hero. In Acts 8, we had the eunuch's response to Philip's question, do you understand what you are reading? And the eunuch replies, well, how can I unless someone guides me? So how can I for Acts chapter 8? In Acts 9, in the vision on the road to Damascus, the Lord identifies himself to Saul, I am Jesus. In Acts 10, we had the journey to Joppa as Cornelius sends messengers looking for Peter. And in the first part of Acts 11, we have the reminder that the kingdom now includes Gentiles, as Peter explains the baptism of Cornelius to the Jews back in Jerusalem. Well, tonight we plan on finishing Acts chapter 11, if the Lord wills, and class might be a little bit shorter tonight since we only have about 12 verses, but... I hesitate to jump into chapter 12 because the first section is a bit long, kind of all goes together, kind of hard to split that up. So tonight, though, let's just pick up with Acts 11, verse 19. So our first paragraph tonight is Acts 11, verses 19 through 25. Acts 11, verses 19, actually through verse 26. Acts 11, 19 through 26. So then, those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except to Jews alone. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord." The news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. Then when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced, 
and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. And he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year they met with the church and taught considerable numbers, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. In verse 19, notice we have a reference to those who were scattered because of the persecution with reference or with connection to Stephen. If you remember from a few weeks ago, we studied Stephen's sermon to the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 7 and how they responded by covering their ears and screaming and taking him outside the city and stoning him to death. Uh, we also learn that the people doing their stoning laid the, the, their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. And in the next few verses, heading into Acts 8, we have Saul leading this intense persecution of the church where he basically chases people down uh, all over Judea and Samaria. And in that context, back in Acts 8, 4, Luke tells us that on that day, a great persecution arose against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And then some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house. And dragging off men and women, he would put them in prison. And so that persecution was led by Saul. So I just want to remind us of that going into this. Uh, since then, of course, Saul has now been baptized. So Saul is now a disciple of Jesus. And here Luke now brings us back to what's been going on kind of in the meantime. Because of Saul's persecution, as these people fled in all directions, they taught the word of God along the way. And as you see in the text, and as you hopefully can see on the map on the screen there, some of these people made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and to Antioch. And as you may be able to tell, I'm still kind of struggling to find some good quality maps that we have permission to use in our live stream. Uh, in some ways, the, the live stream has really, uh, it's crimped my style. I don't know. We used to be able to share all kinds of stuff before we went live. Um, in worship, we can pretty much use any graphics we want. Uh, copyright law has an exception for that. Uh, however, once we go live or once we publish anything online, we are severely restricted and we want to honor the artist. There's a value to that, of course. And um, at the same time, it's just kind of difficult here to uh, find good material that's usable online. A lot of those licenses are very restrictive. But anyway, this is the one map that I could find that was halfway decent. And I kind of cut it down, added my own labels here and there. But I'm using this to try to show where these people went, okay? So when Saul persecuted the church in Jerusalem, the, the disciples fled to Phoenicia. And they fled to Cyprus and to Antioch. Uh, Phoenicia is a country on the far northeast coast of the Mediterranean Sea. It's roughly seven miles across by 150 miles long, north to south. So a very kind of tall, skinny country right up there. Uh, Tyre and Sidon are up there. That may give us some uh, reference point there. Um, so we've got Phoenicia here. Uh, then we also have Antioch. This Antioch that's mentioned here is about uh, 15 miles inland from the northeast corner of the Mediterranean, roughly 300 miles north of Jerusalem. It was perhaps the third largest city in the Roman Empire, uh, right after Rome and Alexandria, Egypt. Um, Antioch at this time had roughly half a million people, so I think the population of Dane County right now is like 560, 570,000 if I remember correctly. So uh, Antioch <clears throat> was an ancient city with roughly the same population as Dane County, so it was a large, large city. Uh, so these were places the disciples uh, might have thought would have been out of reach of Saul and his persecution. And then we also have Cyprus, kind of the island over there. Um, in my mind, at least from the time I was a little kid, I always thought Cyprus looked a lot like the United States. Um, I'm, I'm assuming I'm not the only one who's mentioned that. Have you guys noticed that? Kind of got Maine sticking up there in the kind of northeast corner, got Florida hanging down in the in the southeast, and got a little uh, protrusion, almost looks like Texas hanging down there, and then the Pacific Northwest. But anyway, I can kind of see the U.S. in Cyprus, but that's what I think about when I see Cyprus there. So Cyprus, Antioch, and Phoenicia. And again, as I just pointed out, these are places that maybe they thought were out of reach of Saul, and so when that persecution ramped up, they, they just got out of there. But we notice here, as they go to these places, what do they do? they teach and preach about the Lord Jesus. And these people were preaching to no one but the Jews alone. Remember, when they first leave Jerusalem, the gospel had not yet been preached to the Gentiles. So that's kind of the last 
information that they had. So as they head out of town, uh, that's the game plan. Preach to the Jews alone. I was reading something this afternoon about uh, camping and backpacking up there in northern Minnesota and a lot of people on the Superior Hiking Trail right now. Um, there is a burn ban, so you can't have any campfires up in that area. Well, if you left on a hike two weeks ago and you don't have phone service up there, you may not know about the burn ban right now. And so there's kind of this lag. And that may be kind of what's going on here. They are only preaching to the Jews at this point when they go up there. Uh, some, though, some men from Cyprus and Cyrene, they also came to Antioch. And notice they begin speaking to the Greeks as well. So they have some maybe better information here. So they are preaching the Lord Jesus. Uh, we know Cyrene is in northern Africa, what we would probably consider to be Libya today. Um, who else do we know in the Bible who is from Cyrene? Cyrene is mentioned previously, isn't it? If you remember when Jesus needed help, the Romans forced a guy named Simon from Cyrene to carry the Lord's cross. And as we learn elsewhere, Simon was the father of Alexander and Rufus. And so in the Bible, we know at least three people from Cyrene. And what I find interesting about Cyprus here is that some of these people fled from Jerusalem to Cyprus. But some people from Cyprus have now traveled to Antioch. It's kind of interesting. There's kind of some switching of places going on here. And these men did not limit their preaching to the Jews as those others did, but they were preaching to the Greeks as well. And the result of this preaching is that the hand of the Lord was with them. And a large number who believed turned to the Lord. So when we preach Jesus, the Lord has a way of causing that preaching to be effective. Uh, good things tend to happen. Now remember, these people are preaching to both Jews and Greeks for the first time. So it's a mixed audience. Uh, Peter, if you remember, opened the door with Cornelius, and now others are following. Others are stepping through that door, figurative, figuratively speaking, we might say. Um, I can't nail this down for sure because the scriptures don't, but do you remember how Jesus asked the apostles, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they gave various answers, but Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. I don't know if you've thought about this or if you have any uh, consideration here, but it seems to me that Peter used those keys, didn't he, to open the door of the kingdom of heaven to the Jews in Acts chapter 2. He was the leading figure on that day. And then he uses the keys again, doesn't he, to open the door to the Gentiles with Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. And again, it isn't really described this way in Scripture. It's not nailed down to that degree. Uh, but it's interesting to me how Peter is given the keys, plural, not the key to the kingdom, as we might expect, but he's given the keys to the kingdom, and, and he's the guy who's preaching when Jews and then Gentiles obey the gospel for the first time. Once this door has been opened, though, others follow, others step through it. And that's what we see here in Acts 11, verse 21. As they scatter, the people preach Jesus, and large numbers of Jews, and now also Gentiles, are being added to the kingdom of God. In verse 22, this news gets to Jerusalem, and they hear about this, and they send Barnabas, um, some commentaries were speculating that maybe there is some uh, uncertainty here, maybe some skepticism. What in the world is going on? We're hearing some weird, weird stuff come out of Antioch. And, you know, maybe that was part of the motivation. Perhaps it was. Um, but they send Barnabas. And this, I think, is now the third time that we find Barnabas in the Bible. The first time at the end of Acts 4. You may remember that Barnabas sells the piece of land and he brings that money to the apostles to distribute. Uh, the second time in Acts 9 comes as Barnabas helps introduce Saul to the church in Jerusalem when they were scared that, you know, Saul wanted to identify or, um, you know, become acquainted with the church in Jerusalem. And they were all skeptical. They knew about his past and they were kind of scared there. And Barnabas steps in and basically says, this guy is okay. I know him. And here it almost seems as if the church sends Barnabas as a uh, one-man encouragement squad, doesn't it? 
these people need some help. Barnabas is an encouraging guy. We need to send him up there uh, to get this done. So a bunch of new people obey the gospel, Jews and Gentiles alike. It's a strange situation, and they need some Barnabas. And so the church in Jerusalem sends Barnabas up to Antioch. And uh, years ago, I read an interesting article about the church sending people on missions like this. Um, they didn't just say, hey, you go over there. That's not really the concept of sending somebody. Uh, but instead, this article was pointing out sending usually implies equipping them for the trip. Uh, sending them with the supplies, the resources that they need to be successful. So there seems to be maybe some kind of financial commitment there. I was watching a show, I think on Amazon Prime or maybe Netflix. I can't remember the other night about some overland uh, trip. It's got, uh, you know, decked out the Toyota trucks and a trailer and everything. And they were kind of retracing some trail. The first uh, cross continent, the first guy to reach the Pacific back in, I think, 1793. And it was a huge deal to... Uh, equip a, a mission like that. A lot of resources were needed. And so the similar idea here, they send Barnabas up to Antioch. So one man might be making the trip, but it was the whole church who made that trip possible. Notice when Barnabas gets to Antioch, he does what Barnabas does, doesn't he? He sees what's going on. He rejoices. So there's some evaluation of what's happening here. This is not a bad thing. This is a good thing. So he's happy about it. And then he encourages. This is what Barnabas does. He encourages them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. Just kind of a side note on here. If he encourages them to remain true to the Lord, doesn't that seem to suggest that it's possible to not remain true to the Lord? I know some people today think once you're saved, you're always saved. There's nothing you can ever do to lose that. Uh, but this obviously would argue against that. He has to encourage these people to remain true to the Lord because they had a choice. Um, do people still need that kind of encouragement today? Do we need to be encouraged to stay true to the Lord? Absolutely we do. Uh, we know how important it is to stay faithful. That's what the whole book of Hebrews is about. Uh, but sometimes we need that reminder. Sometimes we need somebody to come in and put their arm on our shoulder and encourage us to hang in there. And that seems to be what Barnabas is doing here. This is what he does. This is who he is. As Luke explains in verse 24, he is a good man. He's full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And because of this encouragement, considerable numbers continue to be brought to the Lord. Uh, starting in verse 25, it seems that either, number one, Barnabas realizes he needs some help, that there are more people to encourage than he has time to encourage, and that Saul would be the perfect match. Or Barnabas knows that Saul would benefit from being brought in this situation. Or three, maybe a combination of both of these. And I'm thinking probably number three there. He knows these people need encouragement. It's beyond the scope of his ability. It's, it's a huge situation, so he calls in help. But he also knows that Saul is the perfect person to do this. So I'm imagining Barnabas thinking in his mind, who do I know who knows the law of Moses and the old covenant and the Psalms and the prophets better than anybody, somebody who can bring these Gentiles up to speed. Who do I know who knows the old law like that? Of course, it's Saul. And so he brings in Saul to help with this mission and Saul gets up there to Antioch. And notice this text says they stay there for a year, meeting with the church and teaching large numbers. And this leads to a huge passage in Acts where we find that the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And as you might know, this is the first, I believe, of only three times that the word Christian is ever found in the Bible. I know people may assume this word is found from cover to cover, but it's not. Just uh, three times, as far as I remember. Uh, the next reference comes in Acts 26:28 where King Agrippa says to Paul, in a short time you will persuade me to become a Christian. So that's the second use of that word. Uh, the third time, the last time the word Christian is used in the Bible is 1 Peter 4, 15 and 16, where Peter says, make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or thief or evildoer or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed but is to glorify God in this name. And so it is a rather rare description, and this is the first of these three references. As to what the word Christian means, I've read that the I-A-N, the suffix there on the end, is a, is a suffix meaning uh, little or kind of like of that kind. 
And so these people are seen in a way as being little Christs or little representations or copies of the Lord, we might say. Uh, earlier in the book, you might remember how the religious leaders were impressed with Peter and John and the fact that it was obvious that they had been with Jesus. They knew they were uneducated men. They knew they were commercial fishermen, but they heard these men talk and they were special and they could tell it because they were disciples of Jesus. They were Christians, although that term had not been used yet until here. So why here? Why do we not find the word Christian until Acts 11, 26? Why are these people called Christians? Well, we're not told, are we? Luke does not really explain this for us, but my assumption has been up to this point, the disciples really were seen as being something of an offshoot or maybe a sect of Judaism, a little, you know, sprout over to the side, at least in the, in the eyes of the world, they would look at the Christians and they were very similar to the Jews. And we understand this. They use the Hebrew Bible. They respect the Hebrew scriptures. They respect Moses. They're running around talking about men like Abraham and, and David, and they're, they're quoting and, and that kind of thing. And they respect the Psalms and the prophets and all of that. But now that Gentiles are being brought into the faith in large numbers, it's getting more and more difficult for people to see these people as an offshoot of Judaism. And as time goes on, they probably realize kind of going to the temple isn't the number one priority for these people. That seems to be trailing off. And so they are Christians. They are not Jews. They are followers of the Lord Jesus. Before we move on, I would ask, would the people that we interact with describe us in this way? As we work together, as we go to school together, as we just hang out with our friends and our neighbors, are we different um, because of the time that we've spent with Jesus? Do we come across as being little Christ or little representations or copies of the Lord Jesus? Because that, that's how the early disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. It's kind of an interesting uh, thing to think about there, kind of a challenge for us. Uh, let's wrap it up tonight with Acts 11, 27 through 30. Acts 11, verses 27 through 30. Now at this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and began to indicate by the Spirit that there would certainly be a great famine all over the world. And this took place in the reign of Claudius. And in the proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. And this they did, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. In the first two verses here, we have some prophets showing up in Antioch. And I think this is the first of a number of references to prophets in the early church. But uh, a prophet is somebody who speaks forth on God's behalf. Uh, Moses was described as a prophet. Obviously, Elijah was probably one of the most well-known of all the prophets. Daniel was a prophet. Jesus is described as a prophet. Uh, but here, one of these men, a man by the name of Agabus, predicts that a great famine is on the way. And then we have a note from Luke that the famine takes place during the reign of Emperor Claudius. From secular history, we know that Claudius reigned from 41 to 55 A.D., and we do have reports from a number of secular authors and historians concerning a great famine that was in the Roman Empire for a number of years at that time. Uh, I think one of the quotes was, uh, scarcity of food was widespread uh, in the Roman world. Uh, so once again, Luke, he is not writing fiction. This is not made up, but uh, this is a real event that could be plugged into actual history. In the rest of this paragraph, we come to the application part of this news from Agabus. There's a huge famine coming. What do we need to do about it? Well, these Christians, followers of Jesus, they send a contribution to relieve the suffering of their brothers and sisters in Judea. A few notes here. First of all, notice that they give in the proportion that any of the disciples had means. So this wasn't a tax. Um, Saul and Barnabas didn't send them a bill for this. Uh, it wasn't the same amount from every person, uh, but it varied, and it was a free will contribution. These people gave what they were able to give. I would also note that this contribution was coming from a congregation made up of both Jews and Gentiles, and it was sent to a primarily Jewish area. And so the gospel comes from Judea 
up to Antioch, and now these new Christians, probably from a completely different racial background, are sending contributions back to Judea. It is just a beautiful picture there if we realize what's going on. And in verse 30, we have a tiny glimpse behind the scenes here as the actual funds are sent with Barnabas and Saul to the elders back in Jerusalem. Okay, so they pooled their resources on one end. They sent the funds with two trusted brothers, and they delivered it to the elders on the other end. Notice there's some accountability there, isn't it? They don't just pick one man to do this. This is a two-man job to deliver these funds honorably. Uh, the elders then, we assume, on the other end, on the receiving end, were responsible for distributing those funds. Uh, as shepherds of the church, they would uh, should be aware of the various needs that were going on within the congregation. They would have the wisdom to do that or perhaps share with other churches in the area. Uh, by the way, this is the first reference to elders in the Lord's church. Uh, as we continue reading in the New Testament, we find that the terms elder, overseer, and shepherd are used interchangeably. And they all refer to the same office, if we want to describe it as an office. So elder, overseer, shepherd, it's the same thing. Uh, just describing different aspects of the work. Uh, we'll get, this, uh, get to this later in Acts, but I think it's in uh, Acts 20. Paul calls the elders of the church in Ephesus to meet him on the beach at Miletus. It is the overseers who show up to that meeting. Okay, so he calls the elders. It's the overseers who show up. And then he tells these men to shepherd the church of God. So he calls the elders, the overseers show up, and he tells those men to shepherd the church. So those three terms are used to refer to the same group of men. A preacher or an evangelist is someone who preaches. The preacher does not run the church in God's plan. His job is to preach the word of God. Elder shepherds, overseers, on the other hand, are to lead, and they are always spoken of in the Bible in a plurality. You never read about a, a church in the Bible having one elder. Uh, in the New Testament, we never have one pastor leaving a church, uh, leading a church on his own. It doesn't happen. It's not in there. Timothy was not a pastor. We know he's not a pastor. Uh, pastors are to be older. Timothy is specifically described as being younger. Titus was not a pastor. Titus was a preacher. Even Paul was not a pastor. A pastor, by the way, is simply the Latinized version of shepherd. And bishop is simply the Latinized version of overseer. And so at least in terms of church leadership, we have elder shepherds, overseers, always spoken of as a group, those three terms used interchangeably referring to the same office. And this is the very first reference to elders in the Lord's church. So that brings us, I think, to a good place to pause for this week. Next week, let's pick up with Acts 12, if the Lord wills. And uh, let's get back to the Apostle Peter next week and a kind of an interesting account from his life in the opening verses of Acts 12. Tonight, though, the kingdom now includes Gentiles, doesn't it? Not just Cornelius, but now we have huge numbers now obeying the gospel up in Antioch. But if you can improve on Kingdom Includes Gentiles, please let me know. And I know you're probably running circles around me uh, in these classes. You're probably thinking uh, a dozen thoughts for everything that I say and all kinds of options here and things to consider. Feel free to email me and I would love to hear from you if you want to get in touch with me. If you want to send a text uh, the church line is 608-224-0274 or send an email to Four Lakes Church, Four Lakes Church, all one word, at gmail.com. Or uh, give me a call on the church line, 608-224-0274, and I'd love to hear from you. Uh, thank you for taking the time to study together tonight. I hope to see you for worship on Sunday either at 9 or 11. You don't get extra credit for going to two services, so you only need to come to one. And uh, it's the same service, so 9 or 11, but please also plan on joining us between those two services for a study of Hebrews at 10 a.m. And I was so encouraged this last week. Um, it was crowded before and after the class. I don't know if you noticed that or not, but with a building as small as ours is, as these groups are passing, it, we almost had to yell at each other. I don't know if you noticed that. <laughs> I kind of noticed that in our building. 
and I, I kind of have to slow down and realize I am yelling at my sister. I'm yelling at my Christian brother here. I need to step outside and get some space or whatever. So we kind of have a, a limit of a small facility, but we're splitting up like that for, for a good reason. And uh, hopefully we can, uh, some way God will help us fix that problem in the future. Uh, if you're a member of the congregation, this would be a great time to sign up for one of those two services using the Sign Up Genius account. Let me know if I can help. Uh, if you're a guest, come on. We want you. Um, whenever you can be there, we would uh, we would be honored to have you. Uh, let me know if, if we uh, need to be praying about something. I know a lot's been going on the last few months, and so if there's something we need to remember in prayer or in the bulletin, let me know, and I'd be uh, honored to, to uh, put that in there. Uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the great and awesome God, the one and only. You are a God who can take something as awful as your people being harassed and persecuted, and you can do something amazing with it. We know that all things work together for good, for those who love you, for those who are called according to your purpose. We've seen it tonight in the powerful growth of your kingdom on this earth up in Antioch, among the Jews and the Gentiles. As we face opposition and rejection for teaching others about you, we pray that as we turn, that other doors will open and that others will be encouraged and more receptive to the word. Tonight we've seen how the early Christians helped each other. We pray that you would give us both resources and opportunities for sharing. You've done some amazing things, even in the recent past. We've been blessed, and we ask for your wisdom as we share these resources. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. Thank you for saving us. You are the great King above all gods. You come first in our hearts. In Jesus we pray. Amen.